Welcome back. In the final portion of the marine envenomation presentation, we'll cover the final mechanism of envenomation, stings, and then move on to coral lacerations. I just want to take a brief moment to point out that coral lacerations are not technically envenomations. I only included them in this presentation out of convenience. And though they're not envenomations, they can result in some pretty significant lacerations and secondary infections. When most people think of stings from the ocean, they think of the stingray, with over 150 species, all containing whip-like tails that contain a spine underneath them. At the base of those spines, there are venom secretory cells. The picture in the bottom left, I've circled the spine that you can find underneath the tail of a stingray. Stingrays live in tropical and subtropical regions and only attack when scared as a defense mechanism. Because they tend to hang out in shallow waters, they're often disrupted by bathers and snorkelers. When they do attack, the spine will result in puncture wounds, lacerations, and even can become embedded in the skin or body of a person due to its barbed characteristics. The famous TV personality, Steve Irwin, was stung by a stingray and died. He likely died from thoracic trauma more than the envenomation itself. The picture to the right shows a stingray spine. You can see the barbs present that can make removal difficult. Symptoms locally are pain, redness, and swelling. A laceration or puncture wound can occur as well, and if the puncture occurs into the abdomen or thorax, it should be treated as a penetrating trauma, similar to a stab wound. Systemic symptoms are relatively rare, but can include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, chest pain, and shortness of breath. The first aid and treatment of a stingray sting can become quite complicated. This is due to the fact that the degree or varying range of injury is quite wide. If the stinger or spine is superficially located, it can be removed without much difficulty or issue. However, if it has penetrated the abdomen or thorax, it is advised that a person obtain advanced imaging to ascertain the true location. Essentially, treat it similar to a stab wound as you would in a trauma center. For larger lacerations, hemorrhage control is important. Utilize analgesia, hot water irrigation, tetanus update, and routine laceration care. Antibiotics are not generally recommended for superficial lacerations, but for deep injuries or penetrating trauma, they are. In that case, you must cover for skin flora as well as vibrio species of bacteria. This would mean prescribing or using something along the lines of ciprofloxacin or doxycycline. Another animal that utilizes stinging for envenomation is the sea urchin. These contain long, sharp calcium carbonate spines that have a venom gland at the tip. Now it's important to note that not all sea urchins are venomous. They're located worldwide and envenomation generally occurs when someone steps on or intentionally touches a sea urchin. In addition to the envenomation, the long, thin spines can break off underneath the skin. And it's not uncommon to have envenomation from multiple spines or to have multiple spines embedded below the skin, as you can see in the Sea urchin stings result in intense localized pain lasting about 24 hours and discoloration around the sting site for about 48 hours. Retained spines can often be noted because there's continued discoloration to the site longer than 48 hours and you might be able to see the spine underneath the skin as was noted in the prior slide. Because of the embedded spines there can often be a secondary infection. First aid and treatment of sea urchin stings is not unlike that of nematocyst or stingray stings. You focus on removing the spines if possible, applying hot water, analgesia, obtaining an x-ray to assess for foreign body, updating someone's tetanus status. Antibiotics are a plus or minus situation, but most recommend utilizing ciprofloxacin or doxycycline for large areas involvement. And if a retained spine is present, the best treatment is just time. Over time, the body will extricate it itself. Some people advocate for using vinegar or hot water soaks to expedite the extrication, 
but ultimately surgical referral might be warranted if there's ongoing infection, inflammation, or pain from retained spines. Finally, we will talk about venomous fish, specifically the lionfish and the stonefish. They tend to live in similar areas in Southeast Asia and Indian Ocean. They contain venomous spines on their fins and will often attack when handled or when stepped on. The stonefish is considered to be the most venomous fish in the world. Looking at the symptom profile side by side of the lionfish and the stonefish, we can see that the local symptoms are relatively similar, but in regard to the stonefish, the systemic symptoms can be very severe. The picture on the bottom right is a person retracting the scales and skin from around the spine of a stonefish. First aid and treatment of a stonefish or lionfish envenomation follows the same tenets as the other envenomations that we've discussed during this presentation. Seek to remove the spines from the skin, apply hot water immersion, analgesia, update tetanus, antibiotics is a plus or minus situation, no official recommendations, but for the stonefish, which has that long list of potentially deadly side effects in the previous slide, there thankfully is an antivenin available. The last subject we're going to cover in this presentation on marine envenomations is contact. And once again, when it comes to contact, these aren't true envenomations, but should be covered under this because of the complications. Coral lacerations, also known as reef cuts, are very common, specifically amongst bathers and surfers. It results in inflammation, erythema, and edema around the site of the cut or laceration, but predominantly they can result in secondary infection. The treatment of reef cuts is relatively simple. The wound should be irrigated and any foreign body should be removed. Open wounds or lacerations are ideally left to heal by secondary intention, unless they absolutely must be closed. Analgesia and tetanus update is important, and if infection begins to develop, you want to cover for skin flora and vibrio, as we've discussed previously. Antibiotics are not recommended prophylactically. To close out the presentation on marine envenomation, we'll hit some of the highlights. Most marine envenomations occur via accident or human error, stepping or disturbing an animal or trying to pick them up. Nematocysts discharge a barb and thread that contains venom, and they are active even after the organism is dead, as we discussed with sea bather's eruption. There are antivenins available for several of these envenomations, specifically the sea snake, the Australian box jellyfish, and the stonefish. Hot water is recommended at a temperature of between 40 and 45 degrees Celsius to help limit nematocyst discharge and ease pain. Vinegar is still recommended, but ultimately its utility is unknown. And finally, large stingray stingers should be managed as penetrating trauma. 